have with us Mr. Alec Delancey from the DAIU unit. Mr. Delancey, can you tell us a little bit more about DAIU? Yes, the, uh, that's the Developmental Assessment and Intervention Unit. It's actually a unit of student support services in the Ministry of Education. In that unit, we have behavioral specialists, we have clinical psychologists and school psychologists as well, and we work to assist students to support them uh, we do assessments and uh, behavior modification so that they could be more productive in the education system. They can actually focus better in school and, and behave themselves in a positive way so as to really achieve all that they possibly can. All right. So you are the correct person for us to be talking with today. So uh, we are going to be discussing meltdowns in early childhood. Mm -hmm. So tell us what exactly is a meltdown in early childhood with mm -hmm. early childhood children right well cheryl uh, a meltdown is really uh, and uh, many times a person may say meltdown and, and tantrum uh, but a meltdown is really uh, similar in terms of crying and yelling and probably screaming or sobbing just like a, a tantrum but the difference with a meltdown is that it is a little deeper this is something that uh, the person, the, the, the child, uh, there's no uh, motivating factor necessarily. There's nothing that they want or anything to change. They simply have what we call like a sensory overload where okay. they simply just start crying or start yelling. Or in some cases, um, Cheryl, they may actually start engaging in self-harm. So it's, it's a, a serious thing. And it's a little deeper than just a tantrum. Okay, so tell us what can some of those triggers that we would probably parents look for mm -hmm. in with meltdowns or trauma. Yeah, um, Cheryl, what we find uh, is that many times uh, a parent may have to look to see if there's any uh, song that may frighten a child. Uh, I, I mean, children, they hear a song that may be a screeching song, they will get frightened. But this is a situation where it's a, a song, maybe it's very loud, or probably it's light, it's very bright, uh, or possibly it's an a, a environment that is probably chaotic. Mm -hmm. And so the parent needs to look to see if it is that that might be contributing to this sensory overload that the, the child may be experiencing. So they have to look at these possible triggers to, to rule them out. And if it's not ruled out, you can have this recurring meltdown um, over many different um, situations. So you might find the child having a meltdown at home, uh, or they may have a meltdown on the street, or they may actually have a meltdown in the school. Okay, so I think this is extremely important for parents. Mm -hmm. I want us to be clear in how we, de we define a meltdown mm -hmm. and a tantrum. Right, right. That's a really good question. So we're thinking in terms of this, Cheryl. Imagine you have a child and uh, maybe, let's say they're in the school and they want a particular toy. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a toy on the shelf and the teacher is teaching something. Maybe they involve in, in, in coloring at the time, but this child wants a particular toy. So the child is constantly saying, Miss, Miss, I want this toy. I want this toy. I want this toy. And starts crying and probably throw themselves on the ground and, and I want this toy. So. The tantrum is that they want something. The meltdown, this child doesn't necessarily want any toy or anything like that. They simply start crying and the teacher may walk up to them or the parent, if it's in the home, may actually walk up to them and say, um, what's going on? Um, everything all right? And the child is just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And uh, you can actually have a situation where the child can pass out in a meltdown. Another thing too is that sometimes with tantrums, if, it's, if the child is not sued, it can actually cross over from a tantrum into a meltdown because time is passing, the child is not being sued, and they simply start experiencing, well, it's not a simple thing, they start experiencing the sensory overload. They don't know how to deal with it, and they may just freeze up, or they may actually start banging themselves against a wall, or they may just sit down and be in like in a catatonic state where they just gaze in or kind of daydreamy. 
So that's the difference there. The, the tantrum, it's they want something and they either want a change or they want a toy or they want to be left alone, something. But with the meltdown, there's nothing in particular that they may want, but the behaviors are similar and in, in most cases, more extreme in the meltdown. So from what I'm hearing, it appears that meltdowns, with meltdowns, you need mm -hmm. to have intervention from, say, a medical or an, somebody, an expert person. Well, definitely, yeah, because um, I'm not a medical doctor, but there are a number of cases where a person may actually uh, experience sensory overload because of a medical problem. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that if a parent is noticing that their child is probably uh, just crying a lot or probably they're simply in the corner, uh, they, they, they're rocking and they're screaming or they're yelling or probably they, they're hitting themselves or, or maybe punching themselves, that they really get some kind of intervention, maybe from a medical doctor, a pediatrician, someone who can at least rule out any possibility of any kind of physical abnormality that the child may be experiencing. Okay, so I think we have a very good... Um, description of the difference between a meltdown and um, a tantrum. Mm -hmm. So, in dealing, going further now, how do we um, get assistance? Mm -hmm. How would parents be able to get assistance? Or, not only this, but how can this contribute to emotional development in mm -hmm. young children? Yeah. So, um, on the one hand, parents do have opportunities to actually uh, get assistance through student support services, right? The child can be referred. And uh, in terms of emotional support, uh, the question was how... How would this assist or mm -hmm. would this deter the child from becoming emotionally developed? Oh, um, no. A child will continue to grow, right? Tantrum, meltdown, they will continue to biologically grow. Uh, but what happens is that Sometimes there's a, a dysregulation in how the child reacts to situations as they continue to grow because they may actually be developing a, a, a habit in how to deal with situations. Yes. So it could be that, okay, if I am having a meltdown and I'm screaming, I don't know how to get out from it. Um, or maybe in the case of a tantrum, I, I, I want something, so I scream and I, I yell for it. So going forward, you can have this child not developing uh, socially, knowing how to ask for something in the most appropriate way. So, yes, there can be some challenges where uh, emotional stability is concerned. Of course, we know that, and this is based on research, if a child does not have uh, uh, emotional uh, regulation um, l long term, you can have things like anxiety and panic and depression developing. So, it's really important that parents uh, take the time off to uh, examine their child and, and to just pass it over as the, the child behaving bad mm -hmm. or, or nothing wrong with the child. Um, and it could be that some children are just testing boundaries. Eh? That is a possibility. But it's really important not to simply say, well, he's testing boundary, leave him alone, even though he's bouncing his head against the wall, yes. but to actually intervene because it can be either a medical issue or it can be as a result of some kind of psychological challenge that the, 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 the child may be experiencing. So going back on what you said, um, you talked about parents can get support from school support services, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, would this be through the school if they are attending school mm -hmm. or how can they do so? Yeah, definitely. Once they're attending the school, they have access to making that referral. It will come to the various district offices. Uh, there's a multidisciplinary team that is made up of uh, senior personnel, DAIU, um, school social work, uh, guidance and counseling, special education unit, and all of them will sit uh, and, and examine the case, look at the case, review the case. Uh, look at all the, the notes, anecdotal notes attached to it based on what a, a parent or a teacher may have recorded. And then uh, particular units may now intervene. So in a situation, it might be that um, uh, guidance and counseling, it might be social work may intervene because the parent may also need to know how to treat with a child who's experiencing meltdown and in so doing, not further exacerbate the situation. Alec, that was very important information for our parents. I want to continue this conversation 
But first, let's take a short break. Welcome back. Yes, Alec, as an, um, as an administrator, teacher, I understand the importance of this information for parents. All right, so let's continue with our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, tantrums mm -hmm. and um, meltdowns. Mm -hmm. How can we establish a suitable environment? Is there any way we can set up the environment to um, ensure that the meltdowns are at its minimal. Mm -hmm, Is mm -hmm. there any way we can do that? Um, yeah, definitely, uh, Cheryl. I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, it's a little difficult sometimes because of how the classroom may be set up. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to identify a particular space in the classroom for when that behavior actually happens. Because you will find it happening from time to time among our young ones. Mm -hmm. So it's a safe space that they can go to. It's a space probably where they may have uh, a, a favorite toy or maybe some kind of material that they can use. Maybe it's uh, Play-Doh where they can go and, and, and just maybe squeeze it or try to build something with it and uh, take some deep breaths. And probably those are some of the things you may have to actually uh, train those young ones before they actually have the meltdown. So it's, it's the teacher actually saying to the, the, the class, okay, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed or if you're feeling a little stressed or you, your head is, is hurting a little bit or you're feeling like this is too much and you want to cry, these are some of the things you can do and you can probably just raise your hands and that's, that'll be okay, we can carry you to the, the corner and you can, can kind of debrief there. Of course, the teacher will use the word that the child will be accustomed to. Understand, right? So we can have a sensory corner. You're saying that's set correct. up in the environment. Mm -hmm. And what about for parents at home? Yeah, it's very much similar. Of course, every child's home will be different. Uh, but parents, what they're encouraged to do is to have a similar. Because once you have a, a similar environment in the school and home, there's there's consistency. So the child is accustomed to if they're feeling a little overwhelmed in school, there's a corner. Likewise, if they have a similar corner home, that will be something that they can will truly help them to de-escalate and to carry the, 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 the tantrum down. So similar, maybe it's a teddy bear, maybe it's a pillow. I know some children, they may have a box. So a, a normal box that they will just climb into and just stay there for a little while in a little fetal position as they relax themselves. So that's a, a, a simple a strategy that a parent can actually use home. Some some children, they may have a favorite blanket. So they, they will throw the blanket over them when they're experiencing this, this tantrum. And that too can help them to self-soothe and you know reduce the tantrum effect. So uh, as we are talking about parents, we see that happening a lot with children bringing their blankets. But what are you talking about just mm -hmm. now, um, children jumping into a box or mm -hmm. wouldn't a parent feel anxiety seeing mm -hmm. things like that um some parents if you they're not trained or they're not educated and this is a way that a child self so they may actually feel a little anxious it's like why is my child going in the corner in, in next to, in, a, in a box or, or something like that i i had a a student i was working with and while doing the session he slid off the chair and went under the table. And he was in this kind of position because he was feeling a little overwhelmed at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, because of my training, I didn't pull him out and say, come on, continue the session. Mm -hmm. But I actually bent over and I continued talking to him. And I created a little checklist right there and then. And I said, okay, every question you answer... You take the pen and you can put a little check next to the right. question or next to one or next to two. And I started pulling it away and away further from him. Eventually, he came back out and he sat down and he continued. Mm -hmm. So it's just exposing the parent to possible techniques. Some of the techniques, it might seem a little strange at first or a little weird. Mm -hmm. But once a parent gets accustomed to using it, 
um, what they will find actually is that they will have to use it less and less because the child now will be self-soothing and less likely to have to experience a tantrum or, or some sort of meltdown because they will have gain some level of control mm -hmm. over their emotions. So are there any long-term lasting effects from tantrums and or meltdowns that yeah. we can possibly look for, you know, in children? Right. Um, there's some long-term. Uh, it, it, now, the long-term could be way down the road into adulthood, or it could actually be within the same term. Uh, that's a little shorter, where they may actually... Um, because of the, the, the tantrums, uh, they're not completing their work. They're not paying attention. Maybe when the teacher is talking, they're a little fidgety or becoming a little afraid of the teacher when he or she walks close by and they, they sort of close up. So they're not completing the task. They're not completing the work. It's incomplete. They're going home with it. The parent doesn't know exactly where they start or where they stop. Maybe the writing is a little scribble or all over the place. So there can be some effects of a tantrum. Long term, yes, we, we talk a little bit about um, the possibility of having that kind of unregulated emotion and going forward. Um, you can see uh, symptoms associated with depression and anxiety that could eventually happen later down. Now, not in all cases, obviously, uh, but there have been some research showing that when a child does not receive the kind of, of, of care and warmth and uh, assistance to treat with their emotions, that long term it can have some adverse effects on them. So we're talking about intervention strategies there. Yeah, yeah, definitely intervention strategies can help in preventing any kind of long term uh, challenge or disturbance that can arise. All right, so we talked about the children. Let's talk about the parents, the caregivers now. Mm -hmm. How are they to, you know, self-care mm -hmm. and treat with these children? You know, because yeah. it, obviously they will be affected. Mm -hmm. So how can they get assistance? Yeah, um, I mean, Cheryl, it could be really tough for a parent who is um, in company or has a child who is experiencing meltdowns or tantrums. Um, sometimes it affects even the relationship between the husband and the wife uh, or it affects the relationship if they have other children because they have to focus now on the child who is, is throwing the tantrum or having the, the meltdown. So yeah, there can be some, some challenges there. Uh, but a parent could do a number of things. Now, number one, um, for example, we have a social, the school social work unit. Mm -hmm. So a parent could actually reach out to a school school social worker and ask how to self-care and that school social worker will no doubt handle any kind of um, strategy or, or suggest strategies to that parent. The parent could also um, do some things that they could uh, um, that, that they feel comfortable with. So, for example, listen to music, maybe something soothing. Um, some parents do that, go for a little jog, go for a little walk, take some time off, maybe um, just reflect, meditate. Some persons who might be religious or spiritual, they can tap into that uh, because it could really get to a parent. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can even be, you know, be bad is that the parent... Um, rehearsing that kind of experience uh, more and more onto the child. So there's a kind of transference now. I am, as a parent, I have not dealt with this challenging situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to deal with it. And I escalate in my behavior in a negative way. Right. And it further exacerbates the situation with the tantrum or with the meltdown. And then the child escalates. You, as a parent, escalates. And before you know it, it's, it's a really volatile situation. It's chaotic in the house. So it's really important that a parent just take some time off. And it doesn't have to be long, you know. It could just be, what, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. 5 minutes. Take a little walk around the house. Have a garden. Even walk with the child. Talk with the child. You know, interact with the child. Remember, the child is, is not a bad child. Eh? The child is simply experiencing uh, a, a wave of emotions that they may not be aware of how to treat with it. So there's where the parent just interacting with the child, being there, showing that kindness, that love, that warmth, that will help in a significant way. Thank you so much for that. 
Alec, we'll take a short break at this point in time. As we continue our conversation with Alec. Mm -hmm. So, Alec, our conversation has been very interesting, and I know that we have provided a lot of information for both educators and the parents. So, as we continue, mm -hmm. what role can communication between parents and teachers, um, what role can you suggest mm -hmm. for parents and teachers working together to um, provide strategies to give some assistance mm -hmm. to parents. So we're looking yeah. at teachers giving assistance to parents. How can mm -hmm. that um, occur? Yeah, it's, it's really important, uh, Cheryl, because um, sometimes I have actually met uh, teachers who list a number of behaviors associated with tantrums. And when presented to the parent, the parent says, I don't know that child you're talking about, you know. So it is, it is possible that you can see one set of behaviors in one particular environment and not necessarily see it in another one. So it might be advantageous, for example, if that is happening, uh, let's say there's the, the, the tantrum in the school, that the teacher communicates with the parent and say, and, and say you know, I noticed that, that your, your, your son, I mean, he's really good in class. Of course, you want to say the positive because there are some positives. Oh. He's really good in class. He pays attention. He focuses and so forth. But there are occasions when I, I find that he just stops. He starts crying. He starts yelling. He's sobbing. Sometimes when I try to approach him, he falls on the ground and he curls up in a little ball. And mommy, is that something or daddy, is that something you're seeing home as well? And, and the parent may actually say, no, I, I don't see that. Now, that's an opportunity for the teacher to ask the parent, what do you do differently? Let's have a conference. Let's meet and talk about maybe what I am doing as a teacher in school that can trigger the behavior unknowingly. And look at what the parent is doing home so as to uh, either de-escalate that behavior or not have that behavior show up at all. And the teacher might be placed in a position to make some adjustments, small adjustments, that can actually remedy that particular tantrum that they're seeing. This is excellent information because I, in, in my role as an administrator teacher, mm -hmm. parents are always in denial. My child is not like this. What you are describing here, I don't see it at home. Mm -hmm. So that and piece of information where parents, teachers can actually say, tell me, Right. What you do mm. that I am not doing or what I can do differently mm -hmm. to uh, manage that kind of, you know, reduce that kind of... This is excellent. I like this information. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us any real-life success story that you have? Would you like to share yeah. one or two with us? Yeah, I, I remember an occasion when uh, there was this, this girl. She was... Uh, she would cry a lot. And uh, especially the mommy is leaving the school. And she, she will become a little anxious. You know, mommy is leaving. Um, probably mommy is leaving me forever. Why is she, is she leaving me with all these, these strange children and, and this, this strange teacher? And over time, though, uh, giving the, 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 the parents some simple strategies, uh, giving the teachers some simple strategies, such as, um, is it possible, teacher to have a picture of mommy so that when the child is a little anxious you can show the child the picture and maybe they may recognize mommy or is it possible that maybe at specific times during the school day maybe it's during the break a phone call could be made to mommy so that that child could actually talk to mommy and know okay mommy i'm, I'm okay um everything is is is, is all right now or mommy could actually say some kind words 
to the child. How are you doing? Is everything okay? Are you settling in? Mommy looking forward to picking you up later on today. We probably will go out for ice cream after or something like that. So it's really important, Cheryl, that there is this communication between the, 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 the teacher and the parent. It, it's really, really important. And I just thought about something that when you were talking about parents um, calling up, you know, teacher can call the, the parent mm -hmm. to um, soothe the child through conversation, yeah. etc. What about how does this, how does throwing a tantrum impact on children's self-regulation? Because you find that mm -hmm. the child may wet himself right there and then, etc., yeah. etc. Et so we know that it adds to the behavior, it adds to that. How mm -hmm. can we see children, you know, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. being assisted with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Uh, parents can take a active role in uh, making certain that they prepare the child before they enter into the school compound. So probably, again, uh, maybe a hug. Maybe uh, some parents, you, you hear them say, well, I, I pray with my child, you know. Or maybe giving them some kind of trinket or a toy that if they're feeling a little anxious. Because it's possible that that's why they may wet themselves, they feel a little overwhelmed. Um, now, there's a number of other reasons why um, wetting themselves can happen, other mm -hmm. medical reasons and so forth. Uh, but the parent creating that kind of environment before the child enters into the school compound and then the teacher being sensitive to that and not engaging in any inappropriate behavior such as a shaming or name calling of the child uh, that will help the child to really self-regulate so they coming from the parent or from the home coming to the school same regulation uh, no stress the environment is just fit for learning and no chaos and even if there might be some kind of challenge during the course of the day because we know sometimes things happen in school maybe there's a little squabble between two other students the teacher based on using basic classroom management strategies mm -hmm. or techniques can create an environment where the, the rest of the student body is not overly affected so that may mean Again, as we spoke about a little while ago, having that corner where maybe those two students that had that little altercation, they can go and maybe do some um, timeout, but doing something productive while they're in that little timeout. And then the teacher can address the class and just have them recognize that that behavior was inappropriate. The most appropriate behavior that they should have engaged in is X, Y, Z. And that too is creating that kind of emotional regulation because... There's no, a, a student experiencing frustration or anger or annoyance. That is a normal, those are normal human emotions. But just knowing how to process it, knowing that it's not, it's not a bad emotion if the student is frustrated. So knowing that I'm still loved, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm still welcome. So even though I'm experiencing a rush of emotions, uh, my mom helps me to regulate miss helps me or sir helps me to regulate and even you can have a spillover effect where other children are now helping other children to regulate yes. so they may not necessarily use the technical terms well the teacher won't use the technical term anyway but a child may actually go up to another one and say um behave or don't cry that's okay and they may actually yes. wipe the tear from the other child or they may hug them and you see some of these things happening in school so again having that safe space that organized that structured environment it really does well in helping to create emotional regulation and something you said just now um you tell the child that okay if this is not the behavior mm -hmm. and you actually let them know the positive behaviors that should be definitely definitely so that is important yes so yes. that is something and what about support let's talk about support for parents mm -hmm. and um when i talk about support i mean can teachers call in parents and speak to them or can they get assistance can mm -hmm. they get some kind of assistance from school support services or, 
you know, to come in and speak to parents. Yes, definitely. I mean, we have been on a drive, for example, the unit I belong to, the Developmental Assessment and Intervention Unit, to support teachers. We have been doing work in the early childhood, uh, that's the ECC, and we have really been supporting teachers and parents as well. So that's no challenge at all. We, can, we, we are accustomed doing that. We have psychologists clinical, school, and behavioral specialists, and we come in and we give strategies to either the parents or even to uh, the teachers. As a matter of fact, just recently, I was involved in doing some training with some uh, parents, and they truly benefited from the experience. So, Alex, tell us, where, where can we get support for parents, teachers? Well, definitely, uh, you can reach out to the Ministry of Education, Student Support Services, and uh, teachers can reach out, parents can reach out. A number of times what a parent uh, may do is, um, especially PTA, they may talk to the principal, the principal will reach out to us, and we could actually come into the school and address the parent teachers, and uh, we can give strategies and techniques so as to know how to treat with uh, tantrums or meltdowns. So thank you so much for this, this enlightening conversation. Alec Delancey from our school support services. Thank you so much. Parents, teachers, thank you for joining us on our conversation. You may have questions, concerns. You can email these at ecc at moe.gov.tt or you can check us post whatever you um, questions, concerns on our ministry's social media page. Look out for the next episode of the Parenting Podcast, Talking ECCE. Thank you. Thank you.